Drama Free Friday yet again. These Fridays just keep rolling right on around, don't they? <laughs> so today is going to be a different kind of a stream, and I'll explain more about that in in uh, just a minute. Sorry, itchy nose. Uh, so I'll explain more about that in just a second, but I have a couple of announcements. Uh, let's see, I'm recording this on December 11th, and... Um, as many of you know, I'm going to be teaching in The Journey Within 2016, A Year of Art Journals, which may not be the exact title, but it's close. And that is um, sponsored by Kyla Givehand. She's teaching every month. She's going to show you how to make a different art journal or book structure of some kind. And then there, is, uh, there are a number of teachers that some are core teachers who will teach multiple times a year and then some teachers are guest teachers and I fall into the category of a guest teacher. So I will be teaching, I think it's in April. And um, so that's when my lesson will come up and that's when I'll be doing that. So anyway, you can look in the description box below the video. If you're on YouTube, you just click the show more and that will expand the box and you can see the link for how to get to the class. Or if you're watching this on my website, you'd see it right underneath the video. So you'll find a link there. Anyway, I wanted to give you an idea of the pricing structure uh, for the whole year. And you really get a lot of content for the year. The whole year, it's $120 for the year or $40 a quarter. And then she also has a special that she calls it the bring a friend special. And that's for two people for um, $190. So you bring a friend. And so one person pays the $190. You guys work out how you're going to, you know, reimburse each other or whatever. But one person pays the class fee. And then that person just tells her the email address of the other person that is like the buddy or the friend. So anyway, it's a way that, that two people can do it, and it's kind of fun to do something with a, with a friend. So you can do that. Next Friday, which is December 18th, I'll be doing a blog post for, um, you know, in conjunction with a blog hop that all the teachers are doing or a bunch of the teachers are doing. And so if you go over to my blog, which is howtogetcreative.com and click the blog tab, You'll see there my blog post, so this is not until next Friday, and then if you leave a comment on that blog post, sometime between the time that you find the blog post there and noon Eastern on Monday, December 21st, if you leave a comment sometime in that time, and it needs to be on the blog post, uh, under the blog post, then you'll, your name will be put in um, the pot and we will do a drawing and one person that I draw the name out of the, the group of names will be given that class for free. So that's pretty cool. So um, all you got to do is watch or read the blog or at least scan the blog <laughs> and leave a comment below. Okay, so you'll find I'll announce that again next Friday. Okay, so I think that's all the announcements. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is completely different than the normal Drama Free Friday. And so I want to explain a little bit of it to you because it is such a great diversion from what I normally do. But, you know, sometimes being different, doing things differently is good. So many of you know that I wrote a book and I wrote this book several years ago. And so I want to um, show you, get some of my stuff out of the way here first. So this is a book that I wrote several years ago called Normal Doesn't Live Here Anymore, An Inspiring Story of Hope for Caregivers. And so this is the printed version of the book. And um, it's it's got lots of pages, but it's easy to read, you know, the the printing is not tiny and it's easy to read. This is a book that I wrote about taking care of my parents. I became an unexpected family caregiver, which means that I don't know why, but I never thought that I was going to be the one that's good doing the caregiving. <laughs> Silly me. Um, I just never thought about it. And so when it happened and they needed me and I needed to take care of them, it was it was a really big shock. Anyway, 
And of course, there was a story that unfolded. You know, there's always a story. Everybody has a story. And so I decided that I would put mine on paper in the hopes that it might help other caregivers that, you know, had to take care of families, you know, that were in a similar situation that that I was in. So anyway, the printed version has lots of um, images in it like this. So these are illustrations from my art journals and um, just in lots of quotes inspirational quotes or quotes that just sometimes just make you think but I all of the illustrations that are in here are from either my art journals or specifically created to go you know through out the book so anyway there's like 80 there's more than 75 I think there's about 80 images that are in the printed book well we also did a recorded audio version of the book and so this is the audio version uh, this is the CD version you can also get a digital audio um, audio book but this is the CD version that we're going to talk about today and so there are six CDs in the set and you'll again find the link for how to get these on the blog or on the on the blog underneath the video and so you'll, you can just look under the video see where the the information is about this and so I thought what would be fun for um, for you get to you know just to get to hear my voice and stuff because I actually did performed and read the book on the recording and so I thought it would be interesting to just play a little excerpt of the book and while the excerpt is playing I'm gonna actually do an art journal page and so first of all let me tell you about the excerpt this, of course, it's an emotional story because it's my story. And as you can tell, I am, well, hopefully you can tell if you've watched me for any length of time now, I'm fine. Everything's good in my life. Uh, but as I take you back in time to when this happened, when I was going, you know, reliving the story, of course, there's emotion and and all that kind of thing that goes on. And so if that, if you are a personal caregiver to parents or family or someone, and or you've been a caregiver recently or something, and it starts pushing buttons in you or making you feel anxious or uncomfortable or something, all you got to do is just say, uh, you know, this is not for me and just click off the video. No harm, no foul, no big deal. It's, it's fine. So um, just so you know, it's perfectly fine to just Turn it off. Turn me off if you don't want to listen. It's fine. But once I start this, I'm going to start doing an art journal page. And the art journal, back when I was doing, starting art journaling, I started doing art journaling before I even knew what, that it was a thing, you know, that it had a name. And now there's people use all different kinds of ways of using an art journal. And some people are artists who have keep an art journal and they do their preparatory work for a bigger work. Like the art journal functions as a sketch. And so they'll sketch their ideas or they work out exactly what they're going to do. And then they translate what they've done in the art journal onto a canvas, for example. So it's truly an art journal. Some people use an art journal just as a way of testing out art supplies. And, you know, and I like to do that too. I like to use, I have lots, let's be honest, I have lots of different art journals going. And usually they have different purposes. So testing art supplies is a great way to use an art journal. Some people use an art journal as art and journal. So they combine lots of words with the imagery um, let's see, how else do people use? Some people do it more words than they do color uh, or image. And then you can do, some people do the way that I started, and that was not knowing that there was a category or a thing called art journaling. And it was just a way for me to process my emotions because I had so much stuff going on inside my head, inside my body, and I just needed to get it out. And so I got a journal. In fact, the one that I worked in was great big. I mean, it must have been 11 by 14 or something. But the first one, the first one I got, I never start small. 
So I got this big old book and I got um, pastels and I got um, watercolors and I got crayons and I got markers and I don't know, pencils or whatever. I mean, I just got some stuff and then I just started putting it all out there. You know, when I was feeling something, when it would get really overwhelming, I would just, you know, put it on paper. And so it's a pretty raw form of art journaling. And sometimes it's not pretty. And I never knew what was going to come out when I started it. And so I'm going to do that same thing today. So when I start the excerpt and you hear it, then you're just going to, from that point for the next few minutes, you're just going to watch me work in my art journal. I may have a completed page. I may not. It may just be marks on the page. I don't know because I never know what is going to come out doing that kind of art journaling. Some of you might know it as intuitive art journaling. It may be something like that. Who knows? We'll just see what happens. So anyway, I am gonna do that. We're gonna start that right now. And again, if it any way bothers you, is upsetting in any way, if my voice is upsetting, if the words are upsetting, you know, just don't, don't get excited. Just click it off to, you know, go on to another video. And that's fine. I'll see you next week. Okay. So I think that's all I needed to tell you. Whoops. Making a mess here. So what's new, huh? When you start art journaling, we tend to make a mess. All right. So I'm going to get things set up here. And here we go. I can be changed by what happens to me. I refuse to be reduced by it. Maya Angelou This book is dedicated to my husband, my friend, and my son, my best. Thank you both for your love, support, and unbelievable patience. Prologue one January, four of us began having dinner together every month. It was finally our time. All of our kids were grown, living productive lives, and no longer needed our daily interaction. The future had arrived, and we could actually concentrate on the lives we'd always dreamed about. None of us were quite sure what might happen next, but we instinctively knew one thing. We needed to cultivate good friends. As we enjoyed our monthly meals, we talked about our occupations, hobbies, and families, as well as our physical changes, and compared the way our mother's bodies had begun to emerge in our own reflections. Month by month, a closeness beyond description knitted our hearts together as soul sisters. After several years, the unthinkable happened. One of us became ill. Several months later, we heard the diagnosis, cancer. Friendship evolved into activity, assisting her family in any way we could. Meals, transportation to chemo treatments, thinking up ways to positively distract our friend's attention, going with her to select her new wig, sewing special hats, and anything else we could think of to put a smile on her face while trying to avoid what appeared to be the inevitable. In spite of our best efforts, cancer stole her from all of us. It was nearly unbearable, our first meal together as we faced the empty chair where our fourth soul sister was supposed to be sitting. Ignoring the vacancy and the deafening silence was impossible. Instead, the tears welled up in our eyes, not only for the profound loss of our friend, but also for each love-filled journey and loss we had endured over a five-year stretch. Those years bonded us for life as we bore witness to the loss of eight people, including our parents and in-laws, as well as our dear friend. One by one, circumstances beyond our control caused each of us to become a caregiver. Accepting the new responsibility without any preparation meant leaning heavily on each other as each of us had been given the primary responsibility for our loved ones. None of us had experience being caregivers. None of us knew what to do first. None of us knew about the necessity of self-care. 
We were the epitome of deer caught in the headlights when the title caregiver became synonymous with each of our names. Barb was the first in our group to experience the loss of a family member. One by one, our losses followed closely behind hers. Through our shared experiences, we discovered how emotions ebbed, flowed, and at times even disappeared. We encouraged each other to feel whatever we felt without judgment. Sometimes it made no sense to feel sad, angry, grief-stricken, or guilty. And the overarching feeling that superseded everything was a longing to get back to a normal life. Every time we met as soul sisters, we brushed the edges of normal. Every time we shared a meal together, we felt almost normal again. Each time one of us said, I understand, and meant it. The crazy one felt a little less crazy. Time has passed. Our lives changed forever. And yes, we each found normal again, a new normal, a new balance. A richer life as caregiver was etched into the facet of our personalities. Oh, how we wish we'd had this book with us on our journey. The insights in Normal Doesn't Live Here Anymore would have made our individual experiences less confusing and overwhelming. So brew a pot of tea, curl up in your favorite chair, and embrace the words that come from years of one caregiver's experience. Barb allows you to walk with her step by step through her caregiving journey as she weaves her story along with her hindsight, questions you need to ask, information you will need and the emphatic necessity for me time. Someone once said, Friends are the family we would have chosen for ourselves. We hope you will follow our example and create your own special family. Wholeheartedly, we can say you need your friends. There is a bond that connects caregivers everywhere. As you read this book, we're sure that you will feel that circle expand to include you. Starting right now, we embrace you. Welcome to the circle. As friends who have been there and done it, we salute you. We honor you. We wish you clarity and peace on your journey. Now grab that cup of tea, find a few minutes, take a deep breath, and join Barb on a journey of love, compassion, sorrow, and encouragement. With love, the Soul Sisters. Preface The world as I knew it had collapsed into chaos, leaving my emotions in a tangled mess. Wandering without clarity from one day to the next, I picked up a pen and began writing. It was a way of remembering and an attempt to remove the incessant chatter from my head. Even as the foggy days of caregiving were playing out in front of me, I discovered that fatigue fathered forgetfulness. I was terrified that I would allow exhaustion to cloud my memories and felt compelled to write everything in the notebook I kept with me. Writing a book was the farthest thing from my mind. Survival and remembering were my only goals. After several years of noting events and feelings, the notebook of thought seemed to take on a life of its own and evolved into the idea for this story. My mother read the original draft when it was about 75% completed. Her response... Thank you so much for writing this. I'd forgotten so many things about our journey together. You should let other people read this. I like it. With mom's approval and encouragement, I'm sharing this story with you. Dear reader, when thrown into the role of caregiver, life often becomes surreal, careening out of control. Perhaps you're beginning a caregiving journey of your own without the benefit of experience and preparation. I've been there and I know how difficult it can be. After each chapter, I've included a practical reflection allowing you to apply something from my journey to yours. I don't pretend to have all the answers regarding caregiving, so this book is not a how-to, but rather a story based around my experience. Please note that names and some details have been changed throughout. I wish you stamina and peace as you navigate your role as caregiver. Blessings, Barb. Introduction. It's only 10 o'clock in the morning, and the familiar fatigue has already arrived. I've prepared breakfast and lunch for my husband and managed to swallow a few bites of food between trips up the steps to care for my mother. So far today, I've made sure that she had breakfast, dealt with bedside commode issues, washed multiple loads of laundry, including sheets, towels, and cleanup rags, given mom a shower, dressed her, and made sure that she's comfortable and contented, hopefully for a few hours. 
An unending list scrolls through my brain. Grocery store, pharmacy, doctor's appointments. Don't forget mom's hair and nail appointments. Plan meals. Make a sandwich for mom and loosen the cap on the insure bottle so she can open it herself at lunchtime. Fold all the clean laundry, run the vacuum cleaner, dust the furniture, clean the bathroom, spend time with mom, feed the animals. Relax. Take a quick nap. Deal with the piles of bills and bank statements. Balance the checkbook. Take a bath and put on fresh clothes. Always be prepared for the unexpected. Check the schedule to see who stays with mom tonight. And try not to borrow trouble. Live in the moment. This moment. One moment at a time. As I catch myself staring out the window, I notice that spring has begun to emerge from a seemingly endless winter. It's been colder and snowier than in past years, and I wonder, when did the daffodils, hyacinths, and forsythia begin blooming? The past few years are blurred as a spiral of despair threatens to pull me downward, my spirit fading to gray and withering beneath the weight of responsibility. Somehow hears a tiny voice whispering, writing can heal. As I listened and remembered, this story began to spill onto countless journal pages. Part 1 Birth Bewildered Bidding Adieu Reflection Just hang on In spite of the appearance of everything falling apart In spite of not recognizing yourself anymore In spite of feeling completely disoriented You can hang on if you hang on, the sun will rise again tomorrow, and you may see the beauty of spring flowers, a symbol of hope. You don't know what to do, yet a tiny voice inside whispers, Hang on, you can do it. Just being able to hear that voice is reassuring. Sometimes you have to ask someone stronger than yourself to help you because you alone no longer have the strength. You could even write the words, Hang on, on sticky notes and put them on the mirror or refrigerator. Stick them in lots of places so you see them often. There's power hidden in these words. I'm sure the flower blooms waiting safely within the frozen bulbs somehow know that if they just hang on, they'll eventually feel the warmth of the sun, allowing them to finally grow. I hope you can accept encouragement from the blooms, and little by little, you'll find that hanging on isn't so difficult. Little by little, you'll store those words in your heart, not just on a mirror. Just like the blooms hidden within the bulbs, please know that warmth and light are within reach. Today, know that you can hang on. Chapter 1. Life Before I came into the world as the baby of my family. My mother repeatedly told me how much my four older sisters adored their new baby and how they voted me into the family. Every month, Mom and Dad held family council meetings in order to distribute everyone's spending money, announce rule changes, and anything else important to the family. The meetings were complete with a president, vice president, and secretary who took notes in special books reserved only for family council details. Their gatherings were also an opportunity for my parents to demonstrate proper etiquette and Robert's rules of order. At just such a meeting, the 13-year-old politely raised her hand and upon recognition began to speak. Well, the rest of the girls and I have been talking and we've decided that we need another baby in this family. So, I make a motion that we do that, okay? Speechless and searching for response, Mom and Dad just looked at each other. Realizing her opportunity, the 10-year-old's hand shot up, and without waiting to be acknowledged, she blurted out, I second the motion. Let's have a baby. We need one. All in favor, say aye. The enthusiastic chorus from the mouths of four girls, ages 7 to 15, snapped my parents back into the moment. Just in time for my dad to regain order, pound the gavel, and in a booming voice declare, Your mother and I say no, we do not need any more babies. Including my mom in the veto stretched the truth just a bit, because honestly, my mother would have enjoyed having babies forever. 
Being a mother was her sole identity, and she wasn't sure what to do with her empty arms. In spite of the parental overruling, my sisters received their wish, and I arrived a few months later, exactly eight years after my parents' last baby. Wonderful memories float through my mind about our years at home together. Christmas, like so many other holidays, was especially magical. Each year I found a new doll under the tree until my parents decided that I'd outgrown such a childish tradition, even though I never really outgrew it. Dad's camera, continually poised to capture formal photos as well as any embarrassing moment, provided countless opportunities we all love to relive and laugh about later. Some of my favorite pictures show all of us girls in our new Easter dresses sewn by Mom and beautiful fresh flower headbands created by Dad, pinching our temples until they ached. No matter how much my head hurt, I loved feeling like a princess, offering my best smile for the camera as I savored the sweet perfume of the flowers floating around my head. Dad enjoyed showing off his ability with flowers anytime. Anything dealing with flowers, including teaching students as a professor of floriculture, building new gardens, and speaking to garden clubs, occupied most of my dad's life. A wife and five daughters were always proud to model his showy corsages and other creations. Dad's snapshots, now housed in photo albums, still instantly transport me back to the happy memories of my sisters and the time we spent together as a family. By the time I was 10 years old, all of my sisters were gone from home, and I missed them terribly. The house, once alive with girls giggling, arguing, and whispered secrets, became strangely silent, and I was left alone with my gray-haired parents. School activities occupied me while marriages and babies consumed my sisters. The age differences between me and the others never allowed real connection, no matter how much I yearned for it. I always wanted to be part of their lives and to be included, but common ground was difficult for any of us to find. I so wanted them to see me as something other than their pesky little sister. After graduating from high school and attending college, my adult life began at age 19 when I married an amazingly talented, supportive man. He was 10 years my senior and recently widowed. His daughter from a previous marriage was almost 11 years old at the time of our wedding. I wasn't much more than a child myself, yet I had no doubt about being a mother. It just didn't appear to be that hard. After all, I'd watched my mother survive raising five daughters, so I could surely help one little girl get through the next few years of growing up. I was lost in my exuberant fantasy of sewing for a daughter, teaching her about things that I enjoyed, and listening to her discoveries about life. I was certain that she would love me in everything I wanted to teach her. Six days before my 22nd birthday, I gave birth to our son, the true light of my life. From the instant that he came into this world, I was in love. Only an occasional moment during his childhood and life at home caused me self-doubt about parenting. Raising a little boy proved to be a challenge from time to time, as my only frame of reference came from living around girls. On the other hand, being a step-parent proved to be a monumental challenge, as I found replacing my stepdaughter's mother was not well-received much of the time. Overcoming preconceived notions about wicked stepmothers purported in books and by not-so-well-meaning relatives added to the challenge of successful step-parenting. In spite of the ups and downs, we all survived our first 10 years together. When my stepdaughter left for college, I believed that I'd passed through the most difficult season of my life. Oh, the blissful ignorance of youth. In addition to being a wife and mother, I've always been an enthusiastic, lifelong student and teacher. Whatever I learned, I eventually taught, a passion I discovered at age 16 when I began teaching piano lessons on the spinet in my bedroom. I love teaching as well as performing. Watching and listening to my students as they progressed from beginners to confident musicians thrilled me. As a performer, I learned very complex compositions that I played alone or in ensemble with a partner. Sometimes we enjoyed the challenge of four hands on one piano, and other times performed on two beautiful concert grands. Early in my life, I realized that music brought me comfort, yet also diffused intense emotions. Anger or sadness could send me straight to the bench to play until the disagreeable feelings dissolved. And then it would happen. Joy. Soul joy. And I remembered the real reason for my music. It was mine, and I loved it. I found the art of decorative painting when my son was a toddler. Once a week, my mother eagerly spent time with him, allowing me a couple of hours for myself. 
Through the use of drawn patterns, I studied the way shadow and light, as well as tints, tones, and shades of color, could create objects with dimension. Occasionally, I'd even try to draw something myself, although my inner critic rarely approved. After several years of honing my skills in classes, my friends asked me to teach them, and my passion for teaching was once again fueled, as I loved watching people discover joy and satisfaction in the painting process. Dolls occupied much of my life and imagination from the time I was a tiny girl. Learning to stitch simple blankets and doll clothes with my mother ignited my love of sewing. Time simply evaporated when I sewed and dressed my collection of dolls. As my sewing skills developed, I sewed ever more elaborate dresses, including an entire wedding scene from my fashion doll. All the hours of designing and pretending filled some of the emptiness left behind by my sisters. When they came home to visit, my sisters thought my creations were pretty silly until they saw how I designed and stitched my own wedding dress and those of my attendants saving lots of money. Many years later, while perusing a catalog, I stumbled upon a book about making cloth dolls and a new idea was born. I could create dolls myself. I knew I could sew the clothing and accessories, but could I design the actual doll's body too? Seeking inspiration, my discovery of the new phenomenon of online communities connected me to doll makers all over the world. I found limitless resources as well as answers for my questions without ever leaving my desk. Doll making evolved easily into teaching, first on the local level and then into a classroom without walls, the Internet. What a transforming experience, students all over the world learning from me without a physical classroom. My passion for teaching exploded and I built a thriving design business that further supported my classes. With help and encouragement from my husband, I created my own line of patterns and rubber stamps and expanded my business from retail into wholesale. In early 1999, one year after developing my new business, in a casual conversation with an associate, she remarked that someone needed to write a book about a specific doll making technique. Intrigued, I began exploring the possibility of writing just such a book, enabling me to teach in a whole new way. Reflection. Passion. Take a moment and look back. Do you notice a recurring theme in your life? What's fueled your existence so far? What's made life worth living? What adds color to your life? The color, life fuel I call it, is passion. Without it, life fades into shades of gray and becomes little more than the act of wandering from one day to the next. If you're lucky enough to have discovered more than one passion, be ever so grateful as one may sustain you during a difficult period when another has been extinguished. What happens when passion has been stomped out by overwhelming responsibilities? When the crescendo of stress threatens to crush you, how can you go on? Begin with one simple choice. So much in life begins with a choice. We never lose the power to choose, even if the only choice you have is your attitude about something or someone. So here's the chance to do just that. Choose to kindle an ember of passion. Even if you choose to try for only a few minutes today, the ember may glow a bit. Tomorrow, vow to fan that tiny ember again. And the next day, choose to give it more attention. And then a discovery. Passion isn't lost, but rather waiting patiently. It was there all the time. Today, you can not only hang on, you can remember your passion and embrace it again. Chapter 2. A Full Heart After spending the summer months absorbed by the writing process, the doll-making book became a reality. Putting my energy into writing helped diffuse my overpowering emotions as I anticipated our son, now grown, preparing to leave the safety and familiarity of home. Simultaneously, my aging parents were needing additional attention, which resulted in them absorbing larger and larger blocks of my time. Within me, I could feel a dormant rebellion stirring. I loved and respected my parents, but I couldn't help recalling their disdain from long ago when I married. They vehemently disagreed with my choice of husbands, who was too old and only wanted me to take care of his daughter. They were so opposed to him that my father refused to escort me down the aisle and made certain that I understood their disapproval with his conversation and letters. When my parents finally appeared at our wedding, I saw their choice of seats. The back pew. I was their last child to marry, but they chose the back row in the church to put an exclamation point on their aversion to my action. 
Reflecting on my parents' appearance that day, I suppose I should have been able to give them the benefit of the doubt, as they'd buried their second-born daughter killed in a car accident only a few months before my wedding. Their grief convinced them that when I married someone other than their choice, they'd be losing another daughter. Our marriage was still strong after more than 30 years, but reliving my parents' rejection of long ago still stung. Struggling with their increasing dependence, I experienced conflicting emotions every time they needed me. I wanted to reject them as they had rejected me, yet somehow I couldn't. My conscience convinced me to set aside the old anger and wounds as best I could. I knew that none of us could go back to hit the redo button, and I certainly didn't want to spend the time I had left with my son, swallowed up by resentment toward his grandparents. In late October 2000, our son began his journey from the Midwest to California. I rode with him in his classic Mustang as far as a friend's home in Colorado, and then, through a flood of tears, bid him goodbye and Godspeed. To see him drive away was nearly more than my heart could bear. For my only son to find the courage and self-confidence to build his life in a place completely unknown to him filled me with myriad emotions. I was elated by his courage to pursue his dream, followed quickly by my fear of the future and a longing for those years when his tiny hand always found its way into mine. I could barely take it in. All the years, all the feelings, all the love. Everything was acute and unfocused in the same instant, punctuated by the searing pain in my heart as I watched him leave. But the clock never turns back, and watching my best launch into adulthood without looking back at me happened whether I was ready or not. Reflection. Mixed emotions. Emotions are funny things. It's possible to feel something so strongly you can't imagine its intensity will ever lessen. The feeling rolls over and over in your heart, demanding all your attention. And it's possible to feel nothing at all. Empty. Void. Blank. Amazingly, it's also possible to feel opposites at the very same time. Well-meaning people may try to convince you that only certain emotions have value. Sometimes they even label the way you feel as good or bad. And you may even do that to yourself. If you're not alert to the danger of emotion labeling, you may succumb to an illusion that tricks you into thinking you can't identify or trust what you feel. The truth is that every emotion is absolutely valid and holds its own lesson. Being the amazing humans that we are, we can feel multiple and seemingly opposite feelings at the same time. How little sense that seems to make and how very confusing. But contained within simple acceptance is freedom. You're free to feel exactly what you feel. There's no good or bad, no right or wrong. Feel what you feel. Express it by talking or writing or just sit in the mix of your feelings, whether exhilarating or debilitating or in between. Simply recognize emotions for what they are. Teachers, in time you'll learn their lessons. For now, there's no need to rush into understanding. Just feel what you feel. Chapter 3. Changes at Home Upon returning home from the trip with our son, I learned that my parents had slipped significantly further down the slope of aging while I was away. One of my sisters, Sanctimonious Shirley, who knew best about everything because of her perceived extra-special God hotline, had planned one of her brief, rare visits in their home. Her intention had been to leave after just a few days, but as Dad was ailing, she extended her stay until I returned. Mild discomfort had evolved into constant pain, and Dad was miserable. Sanctimonious Shirley, usually piously quiet, left long-winded messages on my answering machine about our parents' situation, including her opinion about the cause of Dad's symptoms. I need you to go to the copy store and pick up the pages of information that my husband is faxing to us. He's spent hours researching one of Dad's prescription drugs, and we're certain is causing his problems. With my husband's extensive chemistry background, I'm sure that he's correct in his conclusions about this situation. Not leaving my mother out of the equation, Sanctimonious Shirley continued. Mother's not doing that well either. She's getting weaker, and I'm noticing that simple tasks are sometimes well beyond her comprehension and ability. Each time I see her, she's more confused. But Dad's issues seem to have somehow propelled her into being nearly immobilized. 
This situation is getting worse by the day. Dad's becoming more impatient with Mom as her confusion increases, and Mom doesn't understand why he's so short with her. Nowhere in my sister's plethora of observations about Mom and Dad did she bother to ask me, How are you? My entire life had changed in ten days. Emptiness occupied the space where my son had been, and his room was suddenly void of his spirit, as well as his possessions. From the day my sister left home at the age of 21, she required understanding from me that she couldn't help with our parents, because any situation in her own family superseded the needs of everyone else. I was expected to acknowledge and accept the black and white instructions God delivered regarding her responsibility and priorities. She showed no compassion for the sudden shift in my world and dismissed my aching soul as an unimportant, personal issue. Instead, upon my return home, it was understood that I would immediately assume the role of designated problem solver for our parents. The papers from Sanctimonious Shirley's husband were filled with technical jargon that no one could understand except Dad's physician. Talking with the doctor was hopeless because he was the one who prescribed the medication and dad would never question his doctor. My dad was part of the generation that revered anyone with education greater than his own, which translated into unwavering trust and acceptance that a doctor would never give him something that could hurt him. Frustrated with no cooperation from dad, Sanctimonious Shirley decided to go home just as exhausted Teresa, my outspoken but ever fatigued sister, arrived. As she was prone to do, exhausted Teresa asked our parents a couple of questions, drew her own conclusions, and continued a laundry list of instructions for me. Exhausted Teresa's opinions trumped anyone in conversation, but her smile and infectious laugh somehow softened her tone and could draw most anyone to her point of view. Her years of being an award-winning top salesperson boosted her opinion that she was right far more often than she was wrong making any sort of communication with her a challenge. All my sisters lived less than a two-hour drive away from our parents, but the distance gave each of them permission to insist that I, being the in-town daughter, was to be responsible for our parents. An infrequent trip home gave each of my sisters an inflated strength of wisdom and power to observe. Certainly, there had been occasions when an extra set of eyes and ears proved helpful. This time, however... In spite of my shattered heart, my sisters were not only unwilling to give me any space, they were extremely annoyed by my lack of communication with them. I needed time to grieve the profound change in my life and to grasp the plight of my parents, not a committee meeting with my sisters where they doled out opinions that always felt more like orders. A few days after exhausted Teresa's arrival, Dad's pain worsened significantly and she decided to take him to the emergency room. Exhausted, Teresa phoned repeatedly, leaving messages on my answering machine because she wanted me to go with them to the hospital. I assumed that she was capable of dealing with the situation, so I took an afternoon for myself. Every fiber of my being recognized that as soon as exhausted Teresa left, the task of caring for our parents would fall in my lap. Dad's emergency room visit resulted in a diagnosis of polymyalgia and a prescription for steroids. As soon as she returned home with Dad, exhausted Teresa phoned me and elaborated about her disappointment with me for not being more supportive of our parents and chastised me for leaving her alone to deal with everything. After enduring her verbal lashing, I asked what the doctor said about Dad. If you'd been with us, you'd have heard that for yourself, you know. My sister continued. We saw the doctor on call, and he said he wasn't absolutely certain of Dad's condition, but explained that the new medication should impact his pain level quickly. If it doesn't, he'll have to undergo additional testing. All the doctor really did was send Dad back home with paperwork and a prescription that now I have to go to the pharmacy to get filled. Exhausted, Teresa droned on about our parents, complaining about Dad's attitude, Mom's incompetence, and insisted that something be done about their situation. Clearly, my sister only wanted to talk about mom and dad's increasing needs. She expressed the same concerns repeatedly with different adjectives, just in case I missed the importance of her opinion. Worn down by exhausted Teresa's words, I decided it was time to speak with our parents. Although exhausted Teresa was still physically present in their home, to me she was irrelevant. 
She would be going back to her home in a neighboring state, leaving the blanket of responsibility for our parents resting on me. Late in the afternoon, I arrived at our parents' home and found my dad reclining in his favorite chair. After kissing his forehead, I asked, How are you feeling? Not much different, he sighed heavily. I thought the emergency room doctor said that with the medication, you'd be getting some relief from the pain by now. Do you think we need to call him? Seeing my confusion, my father said, I don't have the prescription yet. The emergency room ordeal occurred in the early morning hours, and it was now 5 p.m., nearly 10 hours later. And the prescription, meant to give fast-acting relief, had yet to be filled. My sister, seeing a crimson flush crawling up my neck, quickly explained, I was just getting ready to go to the pharmacy to fill the prescription. You couldn't possibly understand how exhausting and stressful this day has been. I could barely move by the time we got home from the hospital. What an awful place to have to go. For a moment, I simply stared at my sister. Then I looked at my dad's sad, pain-laden eyes. Mystified by my sister's selfishness, shock quickly became anger as I tried to comprehend her words and attitude. Seething in utter disbelief, I turned from my sister and focused on my parents. After a deep breath, I said, While she goes to get your medication, I think we need to talk for a few minutes. I have a couple of questions for you. Mom slowly walked into the living room and with the aid of her new lift chair, lowered herself to the same level beside my dad. I chose a seat across from them where I might observe their reactions to our discussion. My self-centered, exhausted sister apparently forgot her intention to go to the pharmacy and moved a chair as close as she dared. I never anticipated being in such an uncomfortable position and tried not to fidget as I said. Taking care of everything around here seems kind of overwhelming for you both now. I think we may need to make some adjustments to give you a little extra help. What do you think? Exhausted, Teresa interjected, Oh, yes, they need help. You just have no idea how much help is needed around here. Ignoring her in order to maintain my rapidly diminishing composure, I looked at my parents and waited for a response. After a moment of contemplation, my dad answered, Yes, I think your mother could use some help with laundry, changing bed linens, bathing, and maybe a few other things. That was my dad. He was the one who'd been in the emergency room that day, but my mom was the one who needed help around the house. Gently asking questions and listening to their answers, the somewhat awkward conversation continued and mom and dad's greatest desire emerged. Dad looked at my mom and then at me. After a moment of silence, he said, We just want to stay in our own home as long as possible. What has to happen so we can do that? Willing myself to speak, I said, I'm not sure, but I think we can figure it out. Armed with a tablet of notes I'd taken during our conversation, I prepared to leave. Glancing at my sister, I suggested that she might finally go pick up Dad's medication. She grabbed the car keys, stuffed her arms into her sweater, and muttered under her breath, You think you know everything that's going on around here. You know absolutely nothing because you're never here. And before I could respond to the irony of her statement, She walked out and shut the door behind her with just enough force to make sure that I understood her point. After a moment, I said, well, I'll get to work on this list and figure things out beginning on Monday. Dad, let's see how your night goes and how you're feeling tomorrow. Keep me posted. Thank you so much for coming over. We love you, said Dad. Mom, consumed by her own fears, nodded in agreement as tears teetered on the edge of her eyelids. After embracing each of my parents and assuring them that I would do everything possible to honor their wishes, I left. As I drove home, a fog of fatigue settled around me as I thought about what steps had to be taken to keep my parents safe and comfortable at home. The seeds of anxiety began to sprout as I drove toward my house. I wondered how I would ever figure out what to do. I wondered why finding help was my job. I wondered what was in store for all of us. And most of all, I wondered, what might happen if I weren't successful in my search? My instincts accurately predicted that the shape of our lives had shifted. Joy began leaking from my soul as I faced the possibility that none of us might ever know normal again.
Yeah, so um, that's the excerpt, and I'm just about finished with this part of the page. I may do some more later, but, you know, it's like I'm just going with the flow here, just, you know, whatever seems to express my how I feel about things that went on, you know, at that point in time, I'm just putting it on a journal page. And sometimes I go back later, you know, with a page like this that doesn't really have a, you know, beautiful kind of connotation or symbolism or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes I go back later and I add stuff to it, you know. And uh, sometimes I don't ever come back to it again. So just so you can kind of see what's happening here. And then I have a, a quote here that I'm going to cut apart and put on here that says, if you're already walking on thin ice, you might, you may as well dance. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. If you're standing on thin ice, yeah, might as well. If you're already walking on thin ice, standing on thin ice, whatever, you might as well dance. And that was an attitude that I adopted as I went along on the journey, taking uh, care of my parents and so forth. <laughs> and it didn't happen immediately. So anyway, um, yeah, so there's stuff going on here. There's color because I didn't completely lose the color in my life during that time at all. There's color. That's what I felt today. There's chaos because I felt a lot of that. There were times when I definitely felt like I was going to pull my hair out. Sometimes I think I pulled every hair I had out. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. And in the end, you know, when I ran across these words in the end, I'm like, yeah, it really is. It's a matter of inside out. You can't wait for stuff outside to make you happy. You got to, you know, find it inside yourself. So anyway, so I'm going to add this little quote here and there. And then who knows what else. But you kind of got the idea of, you know, creating... Uh, taking emotions inside. So this is how I felt when, you know, when I was working on it. This is the emotions that I felt when I was doing now. The colors are not dull and um, unhappy colors because, you know, at this point in my life, I look back and I'm really grateful for the time that I spent doing what I did, being, you know, fulfilling that role as unexpected family caregiver. Was it hard? Oh, yeah, it was hard. Am I glad I did it? I'm really glad I did it. And uh, the further I get away from that point in time, the more gratitude I have for those things that I did. And I'm grateful for art journaling because art journaling really does help me um, express emotion and deal with feelings and all that kind of stuff. And something like what I let you in on today with the excerpt from Normal Doesn't Live Here Anymore is it's a story from one time. It was once upon a time. It's no longer today. This is not today. But you know, if if my story can help anyone and give them hope and give them um, reassurance that things will be, you know, the that that you do recapture a different kind of normal. It's not the same normal. It's a different normal, and you get that. Eventually you get that, you know, you go through these tough times. I mean, everybody has tough times and everybody has a story, but eventually you come out on the other side and you figure out what to do and you get your stuff together and, and go forward. So art journaling really helped me do that. And so between the two things, I just wanted to share that with you today. So I will see you next week and don't forget about the blog hop that's going to happen on December 18th, which is a week from today and to leave a comment and you'll be eligible for a chance to win a spot in uh, the journey within 2016. All right. I think that's all I have to share with you. And so I'll see you next week. So you guys have a great weekend, great week whenever you're watching this. And um, I wish you hope. I wish you peace and I wish you love and I will see you again soon. Bye for now.